Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to the last in our series of open studios. Um, just before we start, I'll do the usual little bit of housekeeping. If you want to ask the artist any questions, please uh, type your question into the chat. And when the artist is finished talking, they'll type their answers back. And in that way, we'll save time um, for, for listening to the artist talking, because each artist really only has just over 10 minutes. And um, the chairperson for tonight is Kenny Hunter, RSA. So I'm delighted to hand over to Kenny. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks very much, Sheena. Um, welcome, everybody. We've got four really ex interesting and exciting artists to introduce you to tonight. Um, I think there's some common ground shared by all four of them. Hopefully that will be that will emerge over the course of the evening. Um, but first up we're going to meet is Christina Chan. Christina's practice explores narrative and place through printmaking, alternative photography and sculpture. Uh, she's based in London and has an incredibly well um, researched uh, art practice and uh, is, is in some very serious collections as well, including the Tate and the Royal Academy and the DNA. Um, I guess she may be presenting her work that she showed at the RSA for, for consideration tonight, but that's, of course, totally up to her. The format for tonight will also be, we will talk, I will have a little question for each of the artists after each of them have presented. But now I'd like to hand over to Christina to speak for her 10 minutes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Christina Chan. Uh, thank you, Kenny. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight. Sorry, my computer just told me I've muted myself, but I'm not, right? No. Um, like Kenny said, I am predominantly a printmaker and um, photographer working in alternative photography, but I actually did a lot of sculpture beforehand. So I'm going to share my screen and talk a little bit about my practice. So um, since moving to the UK, I am known for more 2D works um, that are, like Kenny said, based in narrative and site specificity. And before lockdown, it was very much based on this idea of traveling to a specific and usually quite remote place, looking at their impressions, history, archives, and um, really, creating a narrative that is both based on research and kind of personal experience and memory and merging the two together to create this kind of sense or portrait of a place um, and really to create a, a story out of context so as I keep talking it'll become quite evident that travel is kind of a really big part of my life as well um, and so I think that's really informed my practice and vice versa but like I said, I actually came to print in quite a different way. I actually began in sculpture um, and I worked in foundries and specialized in installations, in bronze, lost wax bronze casting, prototyping um, and public sculpture um, in Paris. And that's what I studied for my undergrad as well. Um, but it was, it was really quite interesting so I worked for different artists as an assistant. I worked in galleries. I worked with the city and helped install these kind of massive um, pieces uh, throughout, yeah, throughout the city. And what I actually discovered with print and sculpture, even though they seemed really kind of separate, I found that they had a similar and transferable chemistry involved. So I actually um, started working and training as an edition printer. Um, so I worked in Michael Woolworth publication, as well as various print shops and editioning houses in South Africa, Paris and New York before moving to the UK. Um, editioning also book bindings, um, plate making and, you know, working on different projects. That is out of order. It's fine. 
um, ranging in specialities between kind of relief print, uh, lithography, um, photography, and what I really loved was working with the artists. So I moved to the UK to pursue my MA at the Royal College of Art, where I loved looking at the idea of how to bring the two together. Um, I really loved print, but what I struggled with was this kind of intimate side. So I started kind of bringing the sculptural practice or this idea of how to combine the two into more of an installation or more of a, um, a sculptural form in a way. So my prints are really quite large um, and almost relief based, which I actually find quite entertaining because someone said to me once, they're like, Do you know what, your prints are really, really 3D, but your sculptures are actually really quite 2D. Um, and I, that always made me laugh. So this is an example of a work I did um, back in two, oh, 2015, that's wrong, um, where I took, this is a ceiling panel of an, an, opera, an opera ceiling panel that was kind of broken and fractured. And I took it back kind of through time and through medium. So I carved it out of the lino plate and I actually cast it in bronze um, looking at how I can change the medium, how we can look at various things. And what I found was interesting as well is like this idea of the plate versus the print and what really can be made out of them. So working from kind of one point in time in this fracture in this narrative and kind of bringing it backwards. So I actually made four. And what I really liked about this series was not only the, the mix between the two kind of quite traditionally separate mediums, but also this idea that, so my image started on the left and as you can see kind of moved its way kind of to a more complete form through kind of finding archival images, through research. And then at one point you kind of have to imagine what it is. So this idea of learning from the fracture of kind of curiosity being the spark, being replaced by research and then the imagination taking over at the very end and kind of this narrative that weaves between fact and fiction to create an entirely different narrative altogether is like a, a recurring theme in my work. But there's also a lot of evolution. So this is a similar series, but starting to look at again, different mediums that can use that. So this is actually electroforming, which is a jewelry technique, it creates a chem more like chemically stronger bond. And also I like the idea that it becomes more like a plaque or like bas relief and it's a relief plate as well. So again, just playing with this back and forth. Um, but actually since then I've taken a really long break from sculpture until the piece that's in the art essay now, um, which again is one of the Banksia seeds. Um, and it's these little really bizarre seeds that kind of open in fire and it's their response and evolution to the bushfires in Australia. Um, so again, I, I kind of returned to this and I returned to this just as lockdown was hitting. So, um, yeah, as I kind of had them cast and then everything shut down. And so I had to find a way to kind of clean them up myself in this like alternative kind of household products, looking at how, how I could recreate, you know, all this chemistry, all this kind of knowledge, but in a completely ad hoc mad scientist way, which, um, I mean, I really like the challenge, but it also, it kind of reminded me of some bizarre science fair and I kind of refound sculpture through um, through lockdown, through these bushfires where I was doing an artist residency at the time. And then this idea of kind of having to, I don't know, this constant readjustment and realignment, despite kind of everything that was being thrown at you seemed really apt at the time. Um, so these are the finished products um, and they've been completely polished and cleaned and patinaed um, through non-traditional means. Um, and so this is what's in the RSA today. They are um, 
They won the Ingram Prize, so they were one of the selected pieces back in 2020 and are now also in the Ingram Collection. Um, you can see from the image they're in three states or three different colors and they represent the states in a way of, of the fire of the burning and the opening of the seed, but also in this kind of polished state of the process as well and how the material itself naturally oxidizes. Um, since then, we'll go to a bit of a quick studio tour. I didn't really trust my internet, so I have some photos, but I'll, I'll give it a go at the end trying to move my laptop around. But I feel like it's a bit like you're jinxing kind of the world at this point, but let's see how it goes. So um, I actually moved studios right at the start of lockdown and um, started sharing with another printmaker, uh, Jojo Vilas, who's down here in London with me. And, with lockdown and again, kind of as with the Banksia seeds, you kind of had to find a new way of working, which, which is undeniably challenging, but it kind of set some new bars and goals. And so actually we started seeing if we could set up our own studio. And since then we've been, we got some funding and through some really generous support and help, we've been putting some facilities together because I mean, with print, with sculpture, I think the, the overriding commonality is that you have to have the facilities and a lot of it is this collaboration, this um, kind of community. And when that all shut down, it kind of cut you off from that. So we've been trying to recreate, I mean, in a way, this, this idea of being able to collaborate remotely, but also together and, and create something that is is sustainable, but also a big, big new step for us. So I think that's all I have slide wise. Um, so I'm going to attempt to show you around the studio now. Let's see, hopefully this won't break up. <laughs> Okay, so as you can see, this is our lovely little courtyard and we have an Albion press for relief work. Nice little exposure unit for the photographic stuff. Then just going to try a pivot etching and then a little workspace. how much I'm gonna get. <laughs> Oops. Sorry. So um, it's a great way as well for us to work on bigger projects, work with artists that aren't traditionally into print or you know, know the process so well. So we've been kind of collaborating with galleries and curators and finding creative solutions to say different um, sculptural works, for example, we have a few commissions, a lot of artist book projects, um, and just being able to create this collaboration in a new and exciting way is kind of the current chapter in my life. Okay, uh, thanks, Christina. That was really great to see the inside of your studio and hear how you've adapted to, to lockdown. I think a lot of people felt, you know, that's what you were describing was very, very is very commonly felt and experienced across the art community. Um, I'd like to maybe drill down into some of your motivations as an artist. I took a little bit of time to look at your website and I was thinking about how this idea of entropy is a very common thing in your work, this idea of decay, the inevitable decay, let's say. And mm -hmm. I think if people visit your website, you'll see that, uh, which would, might make people think it's a kind of dark uh, kind of subject. Mm -hmm. But it's also, I also sense in your work a real um, wonder and awe at the power of nature, the scale of nature. Um, I saw that especially in your Asterism series of the cosmos. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about your work in relationship to the sublime. And, and when I say the sublime, I mean the sense of uh, yeah, the power and scale of nature and how we can actually feel incredibly, uh, we can experience it almost as a fear that, because we're so insignificant and we're so fleeting. I really feel your work's got an eye on the kind of timeless experience of the of the universe rather than just you know your day-to-day -day life would that be a fair comment 
Yes, I think I'm definitely interested in, in this geological time scale. I think when I say narrative, each kind of work looks at this fact that, like you had said, we are so small, but I think there is a, a very, it's maybe humbled as opposed to fear, because I think it lets us kind of step out of ourselves in a way we can't normally do, but it gives us a reference. And it also shows, I'm fascinated with the cyclical nature of history, that if you look back at the past, but there's no past in the singular sense, you know, there's one time frame, then there's another, and then there's another, and it depends on what you pick from, what you can discern from that, and even what you can, what connotations are associated with it. So a lot of it can be, say, industrial, or um, let's say in a way, maybe even critical if it's too too recent, because we can then look at what we've done, what we've caused, if it's a geo, you know, geological impact, ecological impact. And then you can also, you can take it back thousands and millions of years, say with nature, with caves, with erosion, and also know that there are ways nature's adapted, there's regrowth, there's in the same way, there's re reclamation as well. Um, and in this way, there is an interaction. And then, I don't know, it's, it's an adaptation as well. And maybe it's a proposition, like I'm fascinated with the fact that I can still walk up into a place, you know, you know pre-lockdown, that is still completely unknown. And so when I was in Australia, one of the things that drew me to it was it's one of the last places on earth that is still unmapped. And it's parts of these national parks. I mean, we know the boundaries, but we still don't know how deep it is. And we still don't know, you know, certain ways to cross it. And it was only very recently, the wall of my national park was only very recently mapped east to west. And I think that's fascinating. Like think of a, a point on this world we've not touched, you know, it's incredible. <laughs> Thank you, that was really eloquent and quite captivating uh, what you described there. And I think uh, your use of the word humbled um, is perfect uh, as opposed to fear, because I think that's really seems right uh, after having heard you speak now and seen the work beforehand, that there's, a, that there's yeah, there's a sense of uh, humility in, in, in how you approach nature and the passing of time. Okay, so uh, that was great. Thanks, uh, Christina. And uh, we're now going to move on to our next artist, who is Poppy Field, who's also based in London. Uh, I can introduce Poppy as uh, having tr uh, as a figurative sculptor, uh, like myself. Bit of kinship there. And uh, you studied at the Florence Academy of Art, um, Chris, and what you also studied the history of art at the Courtauld Institute in London. Um, and she works um, from life models, creating sculptures for both private and public commission, uh, mostly with oil-based uh, clay uh, and water-based clay as well, and ultimately ending up in bronze. Hopefully that's the, the short version of a very richer story, I'm sure, Poppy. Um, that was a great introduction. Thanks, thank Kenny. you. <laughs> It's, it's funny, you said at the beginning about finding parallels between us and listening mm. to Christina's wonderful talk. I didn't just feel a parallel, but a sense of kinship as to what it means to have been a sculptor over the pandemic. Because Christina talked about things such as the foundry closing and finding new ways of working, which I think are two key, theme, two key themes of what I can tell you about my last year tonight. And I really will focus on the last year because some great advice I once had was to never talk about what you're working on or what you're going to work on. And I never really understood the, the significance of that until this lockdown came around and suddenly things were thrown into chaos. I couldn't continue working with life models that meant that the, the large project I was working on at the time, the clay dried and cracked and fell apart. I can show you a very tiny maquette I'd begun and it's easy to keep something small like this around. You can see water-based clay is not a permanent medium and it dries and 
these cracks form and bits fall off. So it becomes totally unworkable, which has led me to other mediums like water-based plastilina because this little figure here is a, um, a portrait commission of a young medical student. And I chose plastilina to begin with, thinking that she'll be away at school and not expecting us to have a year long break and for her to become a doctor, but the, the oil based medium is um, more permanent. It wasn't just my materials that became a bit of a problem over lockdown, but like Christina, the foundry I was working with closed, just moving on a sculpture stand, so it's a bit wobbly. And in the beginning, last March, I thought, oh no, because I had um, a bronze cast of, of this head of a, a really nice fellow from France, and he had very kindly said after we'd done the portrait that I could show it in an exhibition in London the Society of Portrait Sculptures exhibition. And that was due to open, but the foundry had closed with, with my portrait inside. And I thought, what am I going to do? I can't, can't get it there. And quite remarkably, the exhibition went online and it was one of the first exhibitions to go online. And luckily by the time it did, I'd, I'd managed to get in there and patinate it. So at least I had the photographs, but it meant for their show this year, the bust that I have, which strangely enough is still in my studio, although it's online, is made of terracotta. And fired clay is something that I hadn't worked with before the pandemic, but the idea of controlling your process from beginning to end became more attractive. And I'm very lucky where my studio is. It's part of a big craft center that next door to me is a ceramic designer. So she quite happily opened up her kiln and allowed me to continue experimenting. In the very first lockdown, I sculpted various family portraits, including one of my niece, who was two and a half at the time. And I don't know if anyone, any of the other sculptors and printmakers on this call have tried to draw or sculpt a toddler, but it involves a lot of running around the place and Peppa Pig as uh, um, bribery, you could say. But working in porcelain was, was something new for me, but because of my studies in Florence, I was very familiar with Luca della Robbia's white and blue and green bright panels. So I did begin experimenting with that in mind, as you can see here, but it didn't, while it was a very nostalgic exploration, it didn't quite feel like either mine or her. And I work with the figure because I love finding the space between you and the model or you and the patron and creating something together. So the color block finish of the three bright colors is much more appropriate to, to a toddler. Florence was an amazing place to study. The training was three years and we studied with the life model for eight hours a day, but really focusing on translating rather than copying nature. And the culmination of those studies was a sculpture that I made called Everything Is Now. I'll just share my screen. So there we go. And I sculpted this here over three months with a brilliant life model called Ruby, who travels around the world, posing in Oxford and New York and Florence. So we had this wonderful experience of working together in clay and then to the foundry where it became a wax, raw bronze, patinaed before finally being installed in, in a, a private garden by the um, fellow who commissioned it in bronze. And it was a wonderful experience. And while that training is very classical, I've been lucky in coming back to the UK to also begin experimenting with technology. So. We've been, let's see if I can find the book. We've been reducing sculpture since about 1833. The process came about in France and it looked something like this in the beginning. And that essentially explains why there are so many Rodin sculptures. It was before the idea of the limited edition. And technology has meant that that big, large sculpture, I could reduce to this size and equally and it's quite heavy, solid bronze weighs a bit. Um, and equally, a, a figure as large as this, she goes all the way down, 
in a similar way can become just a few centimetres high. So technology is exciting because I think it allows work that might otherwise not reach such a large audience, especially if a sculpture gets planted in the ground somewhere, to go on and have many lives. And that's true for the sculpture I have in the, the RSA show. It's actually born from that final sculpture I did at the Academy, and I'll see if I can share screen again. And it's called Engender because it was born of that work. And it came about because the reduction I, I lifted up earlier, it, there was a bad wax pour and I couldn't bear to see the wax just melted and thrown away. And so I started cutting off little bits and that's how I, I cropped a small portrait and a very, very tiny arm, it was about 11 centimeters, I think. And I just popped it on its side the way I'd seen a, an arm mounted by my professor from the academy, Rob Bodum, and loved it. So I sent it off to be poured into bronze and liked it when it came back, but it wasn't quite big enough. And so began to experiment, thankfully digitally, until I felt it was the size it needed to be to exist independently. And um, this, this sculpture came about that way. And over the last year, it's been exhibited online and technology has not just played into its creation, but also the, the patination even, because the first time it sold, it sold to someone who had not even seen it in person, just through an online exhibition. And then the patron, I, I like to allow the patrons to choose the patina and come to the foundry to watch its application. But because of the lockdown, she had to watch it via Zoom. And that's something that now I, I do when people can't come to the foundry. So definitely a year of learning curves. Absolutely. Okay, thanks, Poppy. That was fascinating. Uh, technical tour of, uh, and I guess the innovations that have emerged out of lockdown. I think we're all getting a sense now that the world won't go back exactly the way it was. It will be changed by this um, event. Um, I got a sense of um, uh, yeah kinship with what you're doing, um, and I was thinking about the words traditional, conventional, and contemporary, and where you kind of feel you fit into that because you've had a very traditional training. But I get the sense that you are kind of engaged with with the contemporary in terms of like that title and gender. I, I guess it had an art historical feel, which with that. Uh, procreate, I guess, is, is is another word for engender, right? Maybe it had a little bit of the Michelangelo finger in it, but I'll, but I also sense that its scale was really quite um, a curiosity. Let's say the scale, you know, and and it, it made me think as a fragment. A fragment's obviously a puzzle as well. When you when you produce or, or display or present a fragment to the world. You're, you're kind of asking the viewer to come in and complete the puzzle or, or, or make a subjective reading of that fragment. So therefore, I would say that you that's a very contemporary way. Maybe Rodin might start it way back, but he's considered the modern artist, let's say. So yeah, I would just if you could maybe open up or talk directly to that relationship between tradition and contemporary and where you feel your, your, your kind of core values are within that. It's a really good question, especially because my studio at the moment is in a heritage and craft centre. So all around me, there are people who do things such as stone carving and stained glass restoration, as well as the object design studios who make some brilliantly um, new, big, bold pieces of furniture. So I suppose when I'm here, I do feel more steeped in tradition. But when I was at the Courtauld, I had the opportunity to work with a variety of organizations such as 154 Contemporary African Art Fair and do a bunch of internships. And I curated a show at the Courtauld where we had loans from Anthony Gormley and Tracy Emin and Marco Maggi. And I commissioned some installations by contemporary artists who I'd seen at the Venice Biennale. So perhaps I'm so used to looking at and feeling a part of a more exciting contemporary art world, I would never want to leave what I do simply in the past. 
but it will always be determined by the subject really and I think with a child so the, the head there it's much easier to look to the future perhaps than it is with um, a much more elderly sitter who of course comes steeped in history having seen the world change. Yeah well I think most of the interesting things in the art world are, are hybrids um, maybe that voice will come more into your work I don't know I guess a lot of it is down to commissions as well and I was going to ask you about that relationship do you find commissions a necessary evil to pay the rent or do you find they stimulate you as an artist creatively? I chose to be a sculptor because of the idea of creating monuments. I was so lucky at the university to do a course with Professor Christine Stevenson and we began studying memory and how it inhabits in architecture and we had the opportunity to write essays that designed our own monuments and I thought wow this is such an exciting place to be because monuments don't necessarily demand anything of the viewer but they are there if you turn to them and want them. Of course the problematic thing is when monuments perhaps hang around too long and speaking as purely an art historian not as a sculptor I think it would be interesting for new works to be erected with perhaps a hundred year lease where they could be reviewed and potentially moved elsewhere and new works could be brought about but as I'm now working on my first proper commission the research that I've had to do to prepare for it understanding that the figures depicted will mean a great deal to the public has been really really exciting and everything from watching film footage of how people move to thinking about how current events in their life will have impacted upon even their stance has really energized me but it's different that kind of project to working with a, a life model in the studio and just trying to create something purely aesthetic. Thanks Poppy. Uh, congratulations on your first commission, um, public commission I should say. Uh, look forward to seeing, I know it's all under wraps now but uh, I'm sure I'm sure we'll find out about that when, uh, when the time's right. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, and now we're going to just uh, the third artist, uh, Richard Goldsworthy. Uh, Richard's currently based in the post Scottish Borders on a residency in Marchmont uh, House. Uh, and I know he's been a very busy artist since he left, graduated from Edinburgh College of Art a couple of years ago. I know he's been to Korea. I know he's um, a kind of very, very motivated and kind of um, hard working artist who's got a really exciting practice. Um, so I'm going to hand and principally to do with materiality and I suppose when it comes to my question Richard I'll be talking about your relationship to materials and process. Well I was going to uh, kind of go into that uh, a little bit to start off with. Uh, I feel my practice is sort of I love to sort of interact with materials around me. Um, how I sort of got into wood mainly as a like a sculptor was because it was accessible. I saw it as a, a medium that I could get to quite cheaply. I was always fascinated by sort of um, having these, you know, doing a sculpting, doing a relief sculpture, this sort of like uh, taking things away and uh, doing that sort of thing. And I couldn't afford stone, so wood was the, the choice I looked at. And it sort of developed from that. I mean, I've always had a, a love of nature and I think I did my first probably uh, stone or wood uh, carving when I was probably like 11 and it's sort of like I got hooked um so I was you know when I came to university um I just I was already working with natural materials and I just sort of expanded on that and and then sort of you know the work I've been working on recently has been sort of a development of uh, a, an accident that I had uh while I was uh, skiing where I kind of uh Broke my, broke my back in uh, halfway through university and I had uh, metal inserts screwed into my back and that sort of got me thinking about adding a different material into another one. And I saw, uh, so wood I saw was like, you know, uh, natural sort of as like me and the metal was, uh, and I, the pewter that I now use in a lot of my woodworking is, uh, is the, the screws and the, in my spine and that sort of uh, relationship between those sort of helped me 
grow and be better. I mean, it was quite an interesting sort of thing. And that sort of developed into what I'm doing now with the, where I'm casting um, pewter into wood. Um, I find the way I cast uh, for a lot of my work, especially, you know, the one which is an exhibition, Darkness and the Light, is um, it's cast pewter on a three-dimensional object, which is quite, <laughs> I found it quite difficult to sort of, I didn't want to do an inlay, I wanted to do a cast. So I wanted to join both of them together. Um, and I didn't want well, to use a proxy, so I used the casting, but I, I had quite a lot of fails with it because you, because you had to, I was relying on the surface tension of the material itself to do the certain sizes or shapes I was working with. And that was quite an interesting sort of dialogue. It's sort of like interacting, it speaks back to you, like you sort of restricted and also trying to push it at the same time. Um, and sort of that uh, sort of like you're trying to push it as much as you can before it fails. And I had quite a few missed pause or stuff like that when I was working with it. And and then like the burning sort of just a kind of a, a byproduct of the sort of with pewter because I was using a blowtorch and I was sort of and I sort of like looking uh, enjoying the sort of like the contrast created through these materials as well. Um, and sort of developing it. But I've always so like uh, combining. It's not, and it's, and it's sort of now I'm sort of like looking at things, what else I can sort of, you know, what other materials can I use to combine and create another dialogue together? Because it was the dialogue which really interested me. It created a new, you know, new language between the two, two materials. And that was, uh, so I've been thinking about, you know, working in stone, glass, all these sort of materials that, you know, together to create something new. Um, but I've also, you know, since I've uh, been at uh, the residency, I've been uh, working on uh, my drawings, um, which I, which is, I, I see my drawings as a sort of um, uh, a new, like a novel, uh, like sort of uh, kinetic process, which is playing in between, uh, like, like makes the work flow between like 3D to 2D, because I'm using uh, three-dimensional objects to create the, the, the fingerprint onto the, onto the paper. And that's sort of like, it has a link to the actual 3D. It's like, it's, you know, um, I see it as, uh, you know, how we as humans have like a fingerprint is that 2D version of yourself, which is unique to you. And I, um, so when I'm doing these sort of like, uh, these drawings using my three-dimensional objects, well, I will show you, so I'm gonna do a drawing demonstration in a bit for two different processes, which I've developed here. Um, but yeah, I thought I might as well probably start with uh, using obsidian. So it's, uh, it's this. Uh, you still see me okay or not? Yeah, I think so. It's good. So it's, 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 yeah. So this is obsidian. So this is one of my sculptures. And it's sort of, uh, it's a very quick process, but this basically. It's So it's trying not to sort of like dictate hugely where it goes. It's, it's the same sort of principle as sort of uh, random walks, where it's sort of, uh, you're never gonna get the same thing again through the same process. It's, it's quite like a, so you never know what really you're gonna, gonna get back to it. So, and it really picks up the, and I'm just cleaning my hands. It's very messy. <laughs> But it really like picks up the details of the of the characters of the, of the sculpture itself. So if I can pick this up and I can show you. See that. So it really the shadow. There we go. So it really picks up the sort of detail of the wood itself and sort of the characteristic created through the movement as well as the sort of uh, the process itself. It's using the so that's sort of what I've been working on, the sort of the transferring of 3D to 2D. So that's uh 
drawing on that side. And then I sort of developed another process since being here, which I've called pyrotic printing. It's it's a different sort of way of working. It's a lot more performative uh, and kind of therapeutic. It's kind of it's sort of using these three-dimensional blocks, like sort of like what Christina was going about, sort of transferring or the link between um, you know sculpture and printing. And this is sort of using sort of the actual the material itself as the press, uh, as the printing mechanism. So these are all like you know charcoal prints, which is quite uh, sort of unique. It's quite a slow process. But it's a very sort of, you know, you have to knead it into the paper, which is a bit. sort of different way of sort of printing using a block which I've created and then using the sort of the carbon of the way it takes off. So these are like, uh, that's sort of what I've been de developing. I've lost the time. Actually sort of got, it's very messy. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah. So that's what I've been working on is sort of the transfer between 3D to 2D. And it sort of like has a dialogue between, it's not disconnected, they're together. Um, and I quite like that sort of as a sort of way of working with drawings. It kind of has a relationship speaking to each other. Can I ask you Richard, about the, is that, um, do you carve into that piece of wood or is it just purely as it comes off the tree? Is that? Um, so I, I carve into it. So I actually, that for the whole process. So like from when it's green, I like cut it down and shape it into the kind of like the, the, like the block and then I carve into the block and then I will continue burning it. I have to re-ink it quite a few times like you burn it after every single usage so it just destroys itself as you're sort of using it you can use it a certain amount of times sure. before it's gone um but yeah and then yeah. it's interesting that it's a kind of um humility involved in that as well like Christina was talking about at the start about or the happy accident or the kind of the idea that the artists listening to the material as much as commanding the material so there's a kind of balance between its voice and your voice in the artwork I would say it was a sort of a happy accident the sort of the idea developed sort of uh actually at the degree show uh where one of the window cleaners knocked over one of my works and because of this floor was completely sort of like clean and stuff like that, it left a mark and that's sort of like locked in my head to sort of like can I make more of a sort of like a use my sculptures to make the drawings itself and I thought so that's how it sort of developed and I sort of progressed it more and I've been like expanding it since I feel like it's definitely got more to sort of evolve into which is quite exciting this sort of yeah which I'm quite yeah uh, Richard, I've had a question in the chat column from Gwen. Uh, you remember Gwen from Mark? Yes. Gwen? She yeah. said, uh, are your sculptures, do they relate to global warming, issues around global warming? And I thought maybe you could answer that question, but also just expand generally on, you talked about the narrative qualities of materials, but you seem more interested in the formal qualities about what they can do. Um, mm. Or would you say there's a kind of, a balance there? I would say, well, I'll answer Gwen's question first. Um, I, I would say, yes, it is. I am kind of, there is a relationship to global warming. And obviously, you sort of, you can, you can only take so much before it goes away. 
uh, especially with obviously the printing process, it's, it's only lasts a certain there before it's gone. I mean, you can't use it ever again. It's disappeared. And, you know, with my practice, I'm always very self-conscious of where the materials come from. So uh, the wood I like salvage, I normally salvage from like uh, storm fell wood or wood, which generally has to come down for health, health and safety measures. I don't go out of my way to pick something to cut down just for a sculpture. It doesn't, that doesn't seem right for me and for my art. Cause I'm, you know, outside of my sort of, you know, my artistic practice, I'm like very into, you know, being outside, being in the mountains, like, like it's, it's key to my sort of who I am, this sort of relationship with. So that, yes, it's very key in my art to sort of like get the point using that natural materials and why, it, you know, material. But uh, I forgot what Kenny said about what, what was. It was more about um, the narrative qualities of materials. Like say, you know, do you, when you're handling wood, you think about wood as um, natural or about growth or about, you know, um, your nature as a, as a subject, or do you think about it purely as a material that you can alter and shape and, and work with? I think it's a bit of both. Um, I think, I feel like I am quite process driven in a sense of, I mean, I like to see what I can do with a material, but at the same time, a lot of my work and what I like to try and showcase is the material itself. So it's it's the sort of the, it's the sort of uh, the combination of the both which creates the work. I don't think they're two separate things. I mean, uh, for identity, which is uh, on the sort of uh, the wall, uh, that's highlighting the growth rings of the of the willow with the pewter, and it's so it's it's and it's the two you know, with the casting um together it's, it's sort of the combination of the, of the both of them together which makes the dialogue on work and you know i work with cracks as well I like to highlight the sort of the intrinsic qualities of the, of wood or any material i work with i don't want um, to put yeah. under a lot one more question richard korea yeah. what, from that experience what would you say was the distillation of that experience for you what was the, the nugget you took back from korea the nugget i took back from korea was to experiment. I think that for me, like one of the, it was just to try new things and don't get stuck into one thing. Um, and I, that's what I kind of took back to heart actually to sort of like, obviously you got to explore into material, but you can't be, you can't be, can't let the material like consume you. You got to expand yourself, not just that. So that's what yeah, I took away from it mostly. Thanks Richard, that's great advice. Thank you. Kenny. Uh, to bear in mind, don't get too set in your ways. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, okay, we're on to our final artist now. Um, it's uh, Jeff, Jeff Lowe. Um, Jeff, would I be right in thinking you're based in Cambridge? Is that right? No, in Faversham. Faversham, sorry about that. In Faversham. Kent, yeah. Uh, Jeff is, is a very established artist and has been working in the last few years at least with aluminium cortin steel and brass in his sculptures and i think one of the things i want to really focus on with you jeff is this uh, relationship between thinking and making which you go on to describe in, in your statement um but that's something we can address or you may want to address it uh, throughout your talk but uh, i'd like to hand over to you now and you can uh, take it from there thanks okay um i wanted to show some images to give a kind of flavor of what I do, um, but more to do with the last year um, during COVID. I moved here to Faversham after living in London for since I was 18. Um, so it was a huge change to um, come to uh, the countryside. Um, and something that I never thought I would do, but it had a huge uh, influence on what, what I've made um, since moving here four years ago. Um, where we bought somewhere called the Lime Works, um, which is a Art Deco water tower, Lime Works, where they purified water 
in the towers and there was a sort of uh, column in the middle which had pipe work and it didn't uh, it didn't last long because it it just didn't work um, didn't function very well so it it stopped in the 19 probably in the 1950s but interestingly when I taught at Canterbury College of Art I used to drive from London to Canterbury and I used to see this as a derelict building um, about 45 years ago and was always very intrigued by, by what it was. Um, it took a year to restore with about seven or eight builders working seven days a week uh, on the interior. And I was very lucky that as part of the building, there was a, a studio, a workshop, which had housed all the pipework for the lime works, which was completely derelict, but, but was to make a fantastic um, workshop studio. And alongside that, it had about 12 acres of land, which I'd never, you know, I'd never made sculptures uh, really for outside. Most of the sculptures I made were were for galleries and for interior spaces. And so this idea of working in the landscape and for outside uh, was something quite, quite new to me. Um, this is a picture of the interior of the studio. And what I tried to create is a kind of world for myself. So a sort of being able to move from the house into the studio um, a few paces away, but I then created a, a maquette studio, a drawing studio and print studio, storage, and we're about to start building a, a, a much, much bigger studio on another plot of land, which I'm um, in the process of uh, purchasing at the moment. Um, so during the three years of, of two or three years working there, the, what, my work changed quite dramatically because the line work seemed to be this extraordinary place where you could see through spaces. It, it's, it's about 10,000 square feet of space and a lot of it isn't necessarily rooms. It's, it's sort of areas viewed between glass and inside and outside. So I was sort of intrigued by the layers. And so I started working in these, uh, on these circular sculptures in aluminium. And I also introduced color into them. And this image is of the show which I had um, just before lockdown at Pangolin Gallery in London. Um, I need to move on. Um, so then lockdown and COVID happened. And I decided, I normally work with assistants and, and have done pretty much all my career. Um, and so I decided for the next, what I thought might be three months, I'd work on small sculptures and I'd been working with a lot of laser cut shapes, working on the computer, um, drawing shapes and then having them cut. So I decided to produce hundreds of these shapes to work with during the lockdown period. So a lot of small sculptures, um, some which were painted, colored, um, some which were patinated, um, brass patinated, like bronzes, and some left just in natural brass. It was an incredibly prolific period. I, I think I produced about 30 sculptures in the year and about 15 very, very large sculptures. And so alongside making the sculptures in the 
landscape, I started making, uh, it's not a great picture, but I started working or, or having built concrete structures where I could show the sculptures. So this particular place is like a kind of concrete bunker. So somewhere in between an indoor and an outdoor space, no roof, but walls of different heights and different um, angles, which sort of complemented the sculptures. So these, these are quite big pieces in Corten steel. So they naturally rust and then stop rusting after a certain period. And then, I, and then I decided after about three months that I brought assistants back into the studio and we started, we started making very large sculptures. I, I like to work on them in my own space. I don't really like the idea of sending things out to fabricators or um, having things made somewhere else. So we try wherever possible to make things in my own workshop. So we bought this huge machine to curve the metal and bend the metal. Uh, th this particular sculpture is one that was commissioned by Faversham. Um, as, as you enter Faversham, it will be in about three weeks, it goes to be sited there. And that, that's it being rusted and, and patinated. Um, so alongside the Corten pieces, a lot of uh, aluminium pieces, which are painted, um, used a lot of color. I'm really very fond of, and, and was taught by a lot of the sculptors who were part of the new generation group, Philip King, Bill Tucker, and I'm still in touch with quite a lot of them. And uh, I felt that that period in sculpture was, was, a, was an extraordinary period, Ch the change from the 1950s to the 60s was something extremely important and dramatic. And um, I've, always, uh, I've always liked it. And it's a period that I thought was kind of stopped almost too short. I think art during that time moved at such a pace that often there wasn't the time to really develop um, ideas fully. Um, alongside making the sculptures, I've always made prints. Alongside uh, listening to Richard, it's interesting, uh, you know, because I think sculptors like to make drawings and prints in a more physical kind of way. So woodblock prints always attracted me. I, I'd never done silk screens, but as I worked on the um, the, the, these are, these are, I worked in two different ways. Some of the prints I worked on in my own studio, which were worked from brass plates, which I colored and then printed from. And then I decided that some of the sculptures seemed to suggest um, silkscreen. I'd never worked with silkscreen, but I knew of Kip Gresham's reputation at the Cambridge print studio, lots of artists had worked with him, Barry Flanagan, um, uh, Terry Frost, a lot, lot, hundreds of artists had worked there. And so I felt there was a real connection between the sculptures that I was making in terms of the layers and the openings and the um, um, ways through to see into the shapes. So I've been to the print studio now during the last 18 months, 10 times. And I work on a three day project each time and produce about 40 unique prints each time. And every time that I go there, the work changes and I start to work in a very different kind of way. Uh, this is so. Th this is this brings us back to the the, the sculpture which I'm just finishing, um, aluminium piece uh, coloured, which is the piece that's behind me because we've we've taken it apart in order to re recolor it. So the colours sometimes change um, as I get used to it, or 
uh, maybe it's the wrong color. Um, I, I I'm, tend to be someone who is responds very much to materials. I have to have a lot of materials around me. I go into my studio every day. Um, I tend not to plan things too much. I, I have ideas about what I think I want to make, but pretty much when I'm in the studio, it changes and they develop very organically and um, very much in terms of what I see in front of my eyes. Um, so I think I've always worked in that, in, in that way. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you very much. That was a really engaging series of images. I really enjoyed looking at them. And I'd like to maybe echo the, um, the this notion of uh, moving location for artists can be incredibly catalytic and career changing. And, and I think your, your setting up in this new studio has obviously had that amazing, uh, invigorating effect on you. And it's been a kind of story of, of this talk, really, uh, with other artists talking in, in a similar way. I'd also probably like to comment on the lineage of your generation and the artists that you mentioned who, who were your part of that group, Philip King, etc. And you can really see that in the work. But I'd also like to, to see, you, you can really see how you've moved it on as well. You know, there's a really, it has a very kind of uh, 21st century look about it as well, though you can see that the lineage, if you like. Um, and I kind of, I really love the way your work is kind of anti-heavy in a way you know it has color has vitality has space there's so much negative space in it um so much kind of looping energy in it you know and it's uh for a static object it's really and that's only one view i'd love to you know get a chance to walk around one of them right at the end of your presentation you talked about the um the the, the way you approach making and i think that's something that's kind of um in the era of conceptual art has become a kind of a kind of ex accepted wisdom that you you have an idea and then you can maybe get other people to fabricate it or you can get get it kind of enlarged or something along those lines but the way you describe your making is that the initial idea that you walk into the studio with on day one evolves significantly through the making process so the making is cognitive making is mm. cool. making is creative it's not just you thinking, oh, I've got this little model, and now I make it big. It's very much a kind of, you're, you're describing it as a very, you're present in that, and in every single faculty of you, yours is thinking and uh, adapting and improving on things as it goes through the making process. Would that be a fair comment? It, it is, and um, what I've always loved in, in, in working is, um, is, is, is accident, you know, the, how powerful accident can be or is it really accident because in a sense if we recognize something during that mm -hmm. process of making we recognize things that we actually identify with anyway it might not be an act so for me nothing is really ever um, a disaster you know it's like it hasn't gone wrong it's potentially something that could and people that work for me it's always like well they always think, oh, no, he's going to be really bad. <laughs> and I always see it like, no, no, it could be really good, you know. So <laughs> nothing's ever terrible. Nothing's ever a disaster. I always think, oh, no, that. And, it, and it's very often the way that the next sculpture develops. You know, it's out of things that happen along the way, things that I spot. Um, you know, so, so it's, it's a real mixture of being very conscious about what it is that you the kind of concerns that you have in sculpture the things that you're interested in which in my case can be quite quite abstract things but you know they're they're mm. very specific in a way but the way that they um can be developed you know there's just so many ways and, th and that's what i love i love coming into the studio and i love at the end of the day having learned you know, if I learn something, if something happens that surprises me, that's magical or that, you know, that's that's for me the great day. You know, that's that's fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I don't envy people who work exclusively through fabricators because they have a they don't go. I mean, one of the things that drew me to sculpture as a young boy was the way that time would evaporate 
in with clay in my hands it would just you know you would lose a whole day and you would you know you literally not eat you'd be so obsessed with the material yeah. it's a it's a really great thing to to be able to say that's what you do i i love the, the this is why i love that the three months in lockdown yeah. i mean i mean it sounds terrible to you know for people to say oh i really loved it i really enjoyed it but it but it was fantastic you know this period of again just me and stuff and my hands and yeah. a few t and and actually very basic tools you know i don't i don't yeah. need a lot of very sophisticated stuff in order to make sculpture you know i always i once said you know because i've i've had big studios i've had situations where I've not had big studios, but in a way, it's not about that. It's about, I always felt, well, if I had a kind of bed sit somewhere mm -hmm. and I made sculptures that were this size, it would, it would still interest me just as much, you know, because I just love making things. That's what gives me the buzz, you know, make just working with stuff and ending up with something. That, that... Thanks, Jeff. Brilliant. I think, I think everybody could probably agree that this concentrated period of time for all its darkness has had some light and for artists who knows it's too early to say but we, we, we can probably expect quite a lot of uh you know interesting and innovative things coming out of this period uh, of isolation. um mm. but thank god it's ending if it is ending mm. i'd like to now extend a thanks generally to the group to to richard to poppy christina and to jeff uh, and to the Royal Scottish Academy for organising this event and to everybody who's tuned in and, uh, and, and hope you enjoyed it. Um, once again, personal greetings to all of you. I'm handing you back over now to Sheena. And can I say thank a big you. thank you to, um, to Kenny for chairing our uh, session tonight. And um, next month we will be starting our uh, live from the academician studio, the two uh, sessions, first one on the 10th of June with Sam Ainsley and the second one on the 24th of June with Wendy McMurdo. So do look out for them. Thanks very much to everybody for coming and enjoy the rest of your evening. And